and these are in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network. Um, I'm happy to be hosting today uh, this webinar um, for the uh, NOAA National Marine Protected Area Center. Um, Lauren Wenzel is at the World's Park Congress right now and so cannot be with us today, but she is sorry to miss it. Um, this webinar is also co-hosted by openchannels.org. MPA News and the EBM Tools Network. And we're very pleased to, he to be hearing today about working across agency lines to improve visitor use management on public lands and waters. Uh, we have three speakers today. Uh, our first uh, speaker is, uh, presenter is going to be Carrie Cahill. She's the Branch Chief and Visitor Use Management Team Lead for the National Park Service in Denver. Uh, the Denver Service Center provides design, construction, and planning services to national parks throughout the U.S. Carrie chairs the Interagency Visitor Use Management Camp Council and has helped develop national planning guidelines for the National Park Service related to the topics of visitor use management and visitor capacity. Uh, our second presenter is Ellen Eubanks. Ellen Eubanks is a project leader and landscape architect at the San Dimas Technology and Development Center of the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, she works on a variety of recreation and watershed projects. She's a member of the Interagency Visitor Use Management Council, its executive committee, and co-leads the Framework Development Task Group. And we also have our third presenter will be Charlie Wally. Uh, Charlie is the senior scientist in NOAA's National Marine Protected Area Center, which he helped found in 2000. Um, recently, this, his work is focused on understanding patterns and implications of human uses on the ocean, particularly in marine pre protected areas. And he represents NOAA on the Interagency Visitor Use Management Council's uh, executive committee. And we're really glad all three presenters can be with us today. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know you can ask questions by typing the questions into the question panel of your user interface. Um, any clarifying questions, we, uh, we can ask the speakers immediately while they're presenting, just so everyone knows what's happening and, uh, and understands all the acronyms. But um, in, substantive questions will hold to the end, and we should have plenty of time for question and answer at the end uh, so we can get those questions answered. But feel free to send the questions in at any point during the presentation. Okay, thank you, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Carrie now. Great, thanks, Sarah, and uh, thank you all so much for joining today. Um, Ellen, Charlie, and I, and the whole Interagency Visitor Youth Management Council are very excited to um, share with you a little bit of background on the council and our current work that we're doing. Um, and we'll also be talking, I'll go ahead and turn the, the first slide um, to what we will be planning to cover which includes um, the history and mission of the council, why did we become a council, and what are some of the things that we're working on, and, and what are some of our recent accomplishments, and then also how this work relates to um, some of NOAA's initiatives, um, and Charlie will be going over, over that. Ellen will be talking about um, the council's recent activities, and I'll be going over the history and mission. We have a number of council members. I saw quite a few names on the list already that are part of the session, so thank you all for joining as well. Um, as Sarah mentioned, there's ways for you all to provide um, feedback on questions via the chat box, so I would encourage you all to do that um, to help Ellen, Charlie, and I on um, helping respond to any questions from the, the group. Um, I also, as I kick this off, wanted to encourage those of you who are learning about the council um, to share this information with other folks in your, your agencies and organizations. So we're going to be talking a little bit about um, a launch of our new website. Ellen will be going over that. And I wanted to uh, just encourage all of you to um, share that information with others. This is a great opportunity for us to keep getting the word out about the Council's work. So with that, I'll go ahead and launch into um, talking uh, a little bit more about um, the history and mission of the Council. First, I want to start off with a definition of visitor use management. Um, given that we have six agencies now working on the council, um, and we all talk about recreation management, visitor use management, um, a little differently, use different terms. Um, and so for the most part, we largely are talking about the same thing. Um, so for visitor use management, the, the council has defined that as the process for managing all characteristics of visitor use and settings to sustain resource conditions and visitor experiences 
using a whole variety of strategies and tools. So everything from education to site management, regulation, enforcement, as well as rationing and allocation. Given um, what I anticipate the audience to be on the call today, I wanted to um, make sure I emphasize that although visitor use management has oftentimes, particularly in the literature and such, been focused on um, land-based environments, everything that the council's doing and everything we're going to be talking about today really is direct, directly and equally applicable to water and aquatic resources. Um, so really, we, we in the council try to talk a lot about all, all public lands and waters, and that the work that we're doing on the council relates to all of those different contexts and situations. So why did we develop a council, and, and why did six agencies think that they needed to come together um, on this topic? Um, we have a whole lot of reasons that sort of um, came together at a, at a time a few years ago, um, but I'm just going to hit on a couple of key points of what were some of the impetuses for creating the council, starting off with a challenge that several of the agencies were facing over the last decade or so in terms of increased amounts of litigation and public debate around how the agencies were approaching dealing with visitor use management issues and meeting law and policy requirements um, associated with visitor use management. And so there were several lawsuits um, that uh, challenged how different agencies were approaching um, those different um, issues and law and policy requirements. And that really started to show the agencies that more attention was needed, more clarity was needed in terms of um, what the agency should be doing um, to deal with uh, these different challenges and uh, public debates, and that um, more than anything, we needed to have more consistency in how we were approaching that across as, um, as agencies managing public lands and waters. So moving on to... Um, some, another challenge, which was that um, there has been over time quite a lot of guidance and, and thought put into how um, we should manage public lands and waters associated with visitor use. Um, but sometimes um, we have that inconsistent implementation across agencies. We also sometimes may not always be fully implementing some of the current guidance and best practices. Um, and when that happens, we aren't necessarily fully meeting our different agencies' uh, missions in terms of protecting resources and providing high-quality visitor experiences, which means we have reduced accountability um, in terms of our agency um, efforts. There's oftentimes confusion in the field in terms of which method to apply, when and how, and what really is the best practices and what's worked well in different places. Um, We've frequently then been unable to demonstrate success at applying some of these um, best practices. And all of this adds cost and time to the work that we do. And it often means we're dealing with issues in a more reactive way um, than, rather than a proactive way. And so because of these challenges, um, along with just a general um, agreement amongst the agencies that visitor use management is really important to what we do as agencies um, and that we really need to uh, proactively plan for visitor use rather than being in that reactive mode to maximize our ability as agencies to encourage access and protect resources and values. And it's really important to mention that you know we're in a very exciting time right now where you hear a lot about initiatives to encourage access and people's connections to public lands and waters. Um, with this encouragement of access, there's a corresponding need to make sure that we heighten the agency's professional and scientific approach to managing the use in a sustainable way. So with that increased desire and need to bring more people to these areas and really help them connect with these wonderful resources and places, we need to correspondingly make sure we're managing that smartly and creatively. And so all of those things came together to really be the reasons why we felt a council that could bring together all the agencies who deal with these very similar issues um, to work collaboratively to provide guidance on long-term visitor use management policies and give direction on the most pressing needs. 
that we have in our agencies by building technical competencies and improving interagency coordination. So that's our mission as a council. We've been formed as a council since 2011, so um, not all that long. We're actually a pretty new group. The group initially started off um, at, with the National Park Service, the uh, Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Forest Service. That was the initial four that came together to create the council. Last year, we were very fortunate to add the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to the council, and this year, um, equally fortunate that uh, NOAA has joined the council. And so now we are six agencies strong, working together um, to basically meet this mission that I have on the slide here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the outcomes that we anticipate from our work, and I believe that as a council we think we're already starting to achieve these outcomes, which include developing consistent guidance across the agencies. One of the first key things we started with, and Ellen will talk a little bit more about this in just a moment, is just getting consistency in the way that we talk about these concepts um, and the way that we define key terms. That was a big part of just coming together um, for the first time and working across agency lines on these topics. We're working to elevate the professional and scientific approach to managing visitor use with the work that we're doing in the council. We're also um, trying very hard to increase communication and collaboration on all things related to visitor use management. We anticipate one of the major outcomes of this to be cost savings and improved efficiency in our collective efforts as agencies to manage use on public lands and waters. And then our hope is, is that this will um, help produce more defensible decision making, um, which is a core part of the work that we do as agencies managing the land for the public. So that, that is our mission and our outcomes and a little bit about our history. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Ellen, who is going to talk um, through the um, work that the council is doing and some of our recent accomplishments. Ellen, are you, um, is it possible you're muted? Hi, I'm on mute. Oh, yeah, there you Sorry, go. Was, I <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> Hello again. Um, this is, you're looking at a schematic of um, what we've done so far. As Carrie said, we came together as a council to provide better um, planning tools for recreation. And we have several task groups. One of them is communication uh, group for a communication plan. We started with um, trying to understand how each agency manages visitor use rec uh, management, sometimes called recreation, depending on what agency you're in, so that we could produce products that were useful to all agencies and would um, more likely be embraced by agencies and people on the ground using the tools. So we put out two position papers that say this is what we are and this is what we think about certain things. Prime, and a lot of it has to do with visitor capacity. And we also worked with the Wild and Scenic Rivers count Coordinating Council so that we're all ta talking the same language. Our primary product so far that we're, we're still working on is the framework, a management, planning and management framework which takes the planner through steps of planning a project so that it is fairly simple, straightforward. You don't want to miss any documents or designations of land. So you know what we're doing. And it's um, kind of a, it's not really a checklist, but it, it could be used in that manner. We also have, um, as part of our framework, come up with the idea of, and it's not new, but we're incorporating a sliding scale so that if a project is simple and not controversial, then it would be simpler to implement. But if it's a high profile project, then you'd need a lot more information. The, pro the framework also includes uh, developing indicators and thresholds for monitoring 
see if you're meeting your desired conditions or you are maintaining them. And this is a really important step and is often left out of other um, frameworks. So we wanted to make sure that was incorporated. There are, we are working on uh, two guidebooks specifically for uh, visitor capacity and indicators and standards, or indicators and thresholds, so that users um, can go more into depth on those two topics. And they're tied directly to the framework. Um, oh, we, we use a, a lot of volunteer uh, volunteers to help us do the work, and we're making great progress. Um, I think, oh, and we will eventually have training. It'll be, I think, web-based training, and we hope to have um, a core group who can go out and help people um, produce a plan. I want to show you the website that we've put up. There it is. Uh, this is our uh, Visitors Management Council website. It's at an nps.gov um, URL because you, they were nice enough to host it. And it, right now it's um, all about us, what we do, what we've done so far in our vision. And I, I encourage you to go to the site and we read what's there. We wanted to be sure that the readers understood what our um, definitions are and why it's important for visitor use management uh, to do it properly. And go ahead, Carrie. Um, one, of the, one of the things on the website is um, a page with the policies and rules and regulations for federal agencies that manage lands and waters. So if somebody is interested in that and needs to know how our product would tie in with their their agency's policies, they can go to that page. Um, go ahead, Carrie. And these are all the, we have a whole page of agency or council contacts. And there is also, I think, on this page, a way to email a message to Charlie, for instance, in um, NOAA, if you have a specific question, or call him. I think that's all I have. So I think we wanted to uh, turn it over to Charlie next to talk a little bit about NOAA's involvement in the council and the relationship to um, some of NOAA's initiatives. So Charlie? Great. Thanks, Carrie. Um, I'm Charlie Wally. I'm with NOAA's Marine Protected Area Center. And NOAA is the new kid on the council, so I thought I'd just take a <clears throat> few minutes to describe how NOAA's mandates and missions intersect with recreational use and visitor use management and a few of the things that we're doing along those lines that dovetail nicely with the council's priorities. We have within NOAA, it's a, it's a big agency and we have a lot of underlying statutes and as a result a very broad and diverse conservation management mission and <clears throat> as those relate to recreational activities there are essentially three somewhat distinct roles that we play. Um, one is that we have some direct authority, uh, statutory authority for a number of federal marine protected areas that 
are found in a growing system of national marine sanctuaries and uh, national marine monuments throughout the USEEZ. So in those places, we're in many ways responsible for planning and managing and evaluating recreational activities in, in the MPA. We also have a number of uh, very productive uh, partnerships with coastal states, primarily through the Coastal Zone Management Act, through which we, um, we help support their efforts to sustain a variety of ocean uses, including recreation in the National Estuary and Research Reserve Systems and in other state waters um, adjacent to the coastal states. And then finally, we, we have a, a role in um, supporting sustainable recreational fisheries through the National Marine Fisheries Service, which works very closely with regional marine fisheries councils and the coastal states to develop sustainable management plans and practices that allow recreational activities to continue um, viably. And the next slide gives a few examples of some of the things that we are doing now, some we were already doing, some we've kind of tweaked and uh, refocused to more closely match the council's priorities relating to ocean use management in, uh, within NOAA's mandates. So one is what we call the call to action for responsible recreation. We've discussed this on previous uh, webinars, so I won't go into it in great detail, but it, it is a uh, statement of interest and principle and concern by the MPA Federal Advisory Committee and endorsed by almost all now of the Sanctuary Advisory Councils that essentially says recreation is important, it's growing and expanding in MPAs. We need to both uh, encourage and promote it as well as to sustainably uh, manage it so that the very features that attract the recreational users are uh, protected over time. So we're doing uh, within NOAA a variety of things to actually fulfill that call to action. We're developing uh, basically an implementation plan so that possibly the next time we have a chance to talk, we'll be able to give you some of the specifics. Um, another part of NOAA in the Office for Coastal Management is developing uh, user visitor use training, which will be intended to uh, educate land and water managers on visitor use frameworks and to enhance those partnerships and sound management practices. So this is a direct reflection of what the, uh, the Visitor Use Council is all about. We're currently um, and about to release a survey to MPA managers that will document both the patterns and trends of recreational use in MPAs as well as glean insight from the managers on their concerns <coughs> and their capacity needs to better manage those activities. And this again is a direct connection to the council. We're building some tools right now that will help analyze and predict and understand and ultimately we hope minimize conflicts among co-occurring uses and in particular recreational uses interacting among themselves or with other types of commercial or industrial or military uses. And then finally, NOAA is a member and is actively engaged in FICOR, the Federal Interagency Committee on Outdoor Recreation, which we hope and believe will sort of blaze a path to make some of the work that we're doing through the, uh, the council happen on the ground. Uh, next slide. This just gives the contacts for the, the NOAA folks involved in the council, which currently are two, me and my colleague, Chris Ellis, who's in the Office for Coastal Management. Um, you can reach either or both of us at this, these numbers and emails. And then there is this more general uh, information e email, which the public can use to, to uh, inquire about specific things. Behind the curtain, those emails go to me and Chris. So you can either email us directly or you can use ibumc at noaa.gov and you will get an answer pretty quickly. 
So I think that's it. Uh, we're, we're really happy to be part of the council and we're very excited to find others of like mind and uh, I think we're going to be able to leverage all this interest into some really good things. Thanks, Carrie. Okay. Um, thanks to all of you. Thank you, uh, Carrie, Ellen, and Charlie. And just as a reminder to everyone, you can send questions in by typing them into the question panel of the user interface. And then I'll relay them to speakers. Uh, let's see, we only have one question right now. Um, and that is, who is the intended audience for the, um, the website? Um, is it government agencies, staff, elected officials, general public, or, or or are all of those? Uh, this is this is Ellen. We have a, um, a whole list of intended audiences, and mainly it's people in agencies, and it uh, it ends with um, the general public. But we're really trying to reach uh, other agencies, federal and public, uh, state, community agencies, and then um, we're also interested in having universities teach this uh, approach once it's all up there. Does that answer the question? I think so. Um, so academics are also, are, yeah, okay. are also a part of our audience. Okay, great. Um, and then there was an additional question. Um, are you looking for feedback on the website? Always. <laughs> um, okay, well then, then great. Then Brenda, maybe uh, if you did want to give um, feedback, go ahead and email the presenters with with that feedback. Um, great. Um, so another question that came up: um, How do you make the connection between planning, planning, ma managing for visitor use and other multiple uses of public space? That's a, this is Carrie. That, that's an excellent question. Um, I think that we, our focus um, for the work that we're doing is on um, visitor use. So we, we define that in terms of um, individuals going to uh, public lands and waters for recreation purposes, including education, inspiration, um, you know, active recreation, those, those kinds of activities. Um, and certainly in certain circumstances that the, a lot of the tools that we're developing could be more broadly applied to a larger um, set of users of public lands and waters. Um, and where that application works, you know, we would, we would encourage that. A lot of what we're doing would certainly um, help folks work through a, a process of making good decisions about all kinds of different uses. But we've definitely focused in on that visitor use space as our primary focal point. Um, Ellen, Charlie, would you want to add anything to that? Or any of the other council members can write something in as well? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll just add one little thought. So it, within NOAA, we've been um, because we have such broad mandates, we we also deal with a really wide diversity of ocean uses, from recreational to uh, scientific to commercial to industrial and military, and pretty much anything in between. So we've been spending quite a lot of time working on um, right now analytical tools that would help us and others understand the interactions among those uses so that we can then take that information and better plan both for what's appropriate and what may be better somewhere else as well as to, to uh, reduce the potential for conflict. So it's, it's a very complex picture, but it's one that we're making a lot of progress on right now. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Um, Another question has come in. Some uh, National Estuarian Research Reserve sites are accessible from a variety of points. How do managers get accurate visitor numbers to these locations? Uh, is there a central repository for the number of visitors to near or National Marine Sanctuary sites? Well, we wish there were. Um, th that's true, and, and that, that general question of monitoring and understanding access and use is it's true in all protected areas, but it's particularly difficult in marine areas. Uh, 
I would say among the US MPAs, the estrogen research reserves have the best handle on that because they are also land-based and they do generally have access points. Um, that's part of what's in that survey that we're about to, to send to those managers is questions about how much they know about this very thing and how do they get that information. So it's a really, really important question and one that we hope to have a better handle on in about four months. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Um, another question that's come in, are the guidebooks available on the website? Uh, this is Ellen, no, they're not finished yet. They will be, though. Okay. Um, is there any way to sign up to be notified when they are ready? Or maybe the uh, questioner could just get in touch with you and let you know that they're interested. Yes, that's a good idea. Okay. okay. Um, another big picture question. Thank you, Morgan. Um, what do you see as the main differences, if any, between managing land and water-based space? Early, do you want to take a first cut at that? Yeah. Okay. So, Morgan, I saw your name on the list, and I thought something like this might be coming. Um, it there, there are a lot of differences, I think, in in the. I mean, the the most obvious is the one we were just talking about, which is the the ways in which people access the space, and the degree to which a managing agency can in any way influence that access or at least even understand where people are going and why and in what numbers. And I think it's generally held that it's it's a lot harder to get a handle on that and to effectively manage it in the ocean than it is on land. Um, so that's part of what we're doing is to try to figure out ways to, to better understand and, and manage the access component of visitor use. The other, which which I think is maybe even more complicated, certainly more complicated, but maybe more important too, is the the complexity and the degree to which the underlying ecosystems are uh, defined by a boundary, or is, as they often are in land to some extent, or more open and porous as they are in the ocean. And so, again, the balance tilts toward, toward, I believe, the oceans being a, a bit more complicated in that way. And so it's a, it's a tricky business to try to figure out how to incorporate those into managing space. But I think the, the basic approach is the same in both cases, is to look at the space as an area where people have desires for outcomes and uses and try to map those out appropriately. Okay, thank you, Charlie. We don't have any other questions right now. Let's give it a minute and see if any others come in. Uh, but the ones, the ones we've had have been very good questions. And uh, were there, was there anything else um, you guys wanted to let everyone know, uh, Carrie, Ellen, and, and Charlie? Maybe uh, one thing we could mention um, related to the question about schedule. We we have on the um, website now our first position paper that outlines um, the uh, council's overall kind of philosophy and approach to visitor use management. It defines a few um, key terms and it um, includes the, uh, the the core elements of the visitor use management framework. So that document is on the council website and available for folks to download um, and look at. Um, there are also some other really great things on the website, including a fuller list of definitions and the frequently asked questions, some of the things Ellen already went through. Um, we anticipate having the framework. Um, it'll be going through a process. We're working on the draft right now. It'll go through a review process over the course of this coming year, and hopefully we'll be up on the council website um, we hope within about a, a year's time frame. Um, we, with six agencies working together, we, we have quite a bit of um, kind of review that we need to go through to make sure everything we're doing is meeting the needs of each of the agencies. The guidebooks, the two guidebooks should be, uh, they're also in the process right now and should be following shortly after the framework. Okay. And we, don't, we didn't have any more questions come in, and that is a great wrap-up. Um, oh, wait. 
All right, well, I said there was another question that just came up. Okay, um, this is from Morgan again. I'm very excited to learn about this cross-agency collaboration. Is there anything similar addressing the broad issues involved in multiple use management of public space? For example, co um, comparing forest planning and marine spatial planning. Not that I know of. <sighs> Yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, probably the, the closest thing that many of you, I'm sure, are aware of is the U.S.'s national ocean policy and the, uh, the effort to develop a, um, a comprehensive well, a suite of regional plans that better uh, match appropriate uses to appropriate spaces in the ocean. Uh, that's uh, very long story, but the bottom line is it, it is progressing. But I don't. I, I'm not aware of anything that's comparable on land or how we might connect the two up, other than through maybe some of the principles and practices that this council will be developing. Okay. I, um, this is Carrie. I, I, I would just agree with Charlie. I'm not aware of anything specific on that topic. I thought it might be worthwhile to mention a, a few of the councils that we are working closely with that folks might be interested in. I think Ellen already mentioned the Wild and Scenic Rivers Coordinating Council, which involves um, quite a number of agencies. That group is one that we've been working closely with as it relates to overlapping visitor use management needs. Um, we've also worked very closely with um, different councils associated with wilderness. Um, also with the um, uh, Federal Interagency Council on Trails, um, National Scenic and Historic Trails. Um, as Charlie mentioned, we've also been working closely with the Federal Interagency Council on Outdoor Recreation. That group has brought together um, all of the councils that are doing work related to recreation and, and visitor use a couple of different times over the last year. And their goal was to continue to make sure all of our different work um, was coordinated as much as possible. So we definitely have been trying as a, as a new council to reach out and work with others who are doing things that are of a similar, um, that have some overlap to make sure that we have that consistency and shared information. Okay, thank you, Carrie, and thank you, Charlie. Um, and we got another question, which is an interesting one. Um, what are your thoughts um, about management of spaces like intertidal zones where there is the balance of water and land um, and use of those spaces? Uh, how does marine management work with land management in, in intertidal zones? Carrie, do you want me to start being the ocean guy? I think that would be wise. Okay. Um, th that is a good question, and it's it's a it's. A, particularly complicated, I think, because uh, the for many reasons. One is it's kind of a tricky environment to work in. Also, the, the threats are principally land-based, so they're largely trampling and collecting. Um, and on the governance side, what, what we find in, in the MPA world is that a lot of the, um, the intertidal areas that are encompassed within a protected area are actually part of a primarily terrestrial protected area. So that just naturally the focus is on land management and the management of land-based uses. And there's less, usually less emphasis and sometimes less expertise to deal with the intertidal. So, so I think it's kind of almost like an orphan habitat in a way, and, and it's something that would probably benefit from some concerted thought to some guidance on how you best manage an intertidal habitat no matter who you are. So I, I think it's a very good question. Okay, and thank you very, very much for asking, Alicia. Um, let's see, t two more questions. Um, will lands that are acquired in the future with federal funding such as the um, CELCP funding through the NOAA program and in the Great Lakes AOC acquisition funding through and then through NOAA through GLRI be required requested to develop a visitor use management plan as part of receiving uh, the other grant funding. Charlie. 
Uh, I suppose there's, there's no element to that question, and I, I honestly don't know, but I could look into it and find out. So this is uh, Carrie. I thought I'd, um, just in, as it relates to that question, something I would share with you from the National Park Service perspective. Um, one of the things that we've been working on the last couple of years is um, uh, working with each uh, unit of the National Park System to assess their um, highest priority planning and data needs as part of um, an initiative we have to create um, foundation documents for every um, park unit, um, which establishes their purpose and significance and law and policy requirements. And as part of that planning and data needs assessments, one of the things we're seeing from the field um, as a high priority need in, in almost, uh, well, in many of the units is a focused visitor use management plan that provides a comprehensive look at all of the different issues and management needs for visitor use management in, in and units of the National Park System. So it's been really exciting to see the field recognize that need um, and ask for um, that kind of planning. They're really looking for implementation level planning that helps them develop more of the how-to part of visitor use management. So that's something that the Park Service has um, really uh, got some synergy and energy around right now and will be working on um, over the next uh, few years in, in a big way. Okay, and thank you for that, guys. And let's see, and Brenda defined some of the acronyms with uh, the CELCP, Coastal and Estuarine Land Acquisition Plan, um, AOC, Area of Concern, and then GLRI, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And so you guys probably knew that, but that was helpful for me. Uh, okay, um, another question, how will the council work with related state agencies? Uh, that's a that's a great question. We've had it come up a couple of times at some conferences where uh, we've been trying to get out to as many conferences as possible um, to present on the council and share what we're up to. Um, right now, the the council has focused on um, the federal agencies. Um, we anticipate that a lot of the work that we're doing uh, would be very applicable to the states. We've heard that from um, folks that work in state agencies. Um, I think it's a situation where right now we anticipate um, you know, sharing the information as widely as possible, the website being uh, the primary platform for that, um, and hopefully um, can consult with state agencies over time to help them um, think about how they might apply some of the work that we're doing. Um, at, that, at this point, we've, we've just decided to kind of keep our work um, at the federal level just because we have our own kind of law and policy needs as federal agencies. Um, but we think so much of what we're doing is, is very applicable and hopefully will be useful to, to state agency applications. Okay, and then um, an additional question. Is there any mechanism or working group to coordinate social research uh, across agencies and our levels of government? Um, that's a, an excellent question. I, um, there's a, a couple of things I think that are happening. And it, there's a, a group, if I'm not mistaken, of folks within a number of agencies that are all in the social science um, focal areas that, that do meet at some regular level and um, I think have some coordination that's happening. Also, um, there was a website dedicated to uh, social science, humandimensions.gov. Um, and I'm not sure, Ellen, can you speak to the status of where that stands, which was an attempt to bring together some of the more social science oriented literature and, and communication sharing. I don't know what's happening with it. It it was, I think, under NOAA to start with, and then the grant ran out, and then um, USGS has it. It's supposed to be, oh, they lost the URL. So, um, Well, actually, Chris Ellis uh, wanted to uh, Oh, provide good. some information. He said um, uh, there's the interagency working group on ocean social science, uh, which helps coordinate social science research across agencies. And then hde.gov is no longer up and running. Um, it, wa it was with NOAA, then went to USGS, and, and is not operational currently. Thank That's you, Chris. Correct. Yeah, thanks, Chris. <laughs> okay. And so that is all the questions for now. Um, I'm giving it a second to see if anything else comes in. Um, so I think that, that that's 
it for questions, and that was a really good question and answer session, uh, so some great questions. Um, thank you so much to, to all the speakers. Uh, we really appreciate you being here, uh, Carrie, Ellen, and Charlie, and we appreciate you sharing all your information about the great work the Council is doing. Um, and so if anybody has any additional questions, I encourage you to get in touch with them. There are the email addresses are up on the screen. Um, if you're interested in a recording of this webinar, um, it'll be posted on openchannels.org uh, shortly. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. We really appreciate you, you being here. So uh, I'll just say goodbye and thank you to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.